Uh, first of all, you know, it, 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 it is a, um, <clears throat> a, a unique occasion, so I'm doing slightly like I, do, I really shouldn't say more. Um, I think there's enough to explore in what Dunmore and David have presented. Um, I think if what we're trying to understand are the fruitful conditions, and unfortunately we can't all build pools by the Atlantic, um, but you get faced with problems like how to fit, you know, information processing into 50 stories, and this sort of, you know, do you just say that goes away, or you just say cities are tough enough to take that, and so you go to some other part of the city and cultivate something that is more urban. Um, do you, if, if cities, the historic centers have been, are mostly facades, except for very, very good rooms. The topography is the kind of savage memory that David is mentioning from Caesar, so you can respond to it. Um, is, is, is it a question, uh, you know, the, the terms that keep coming up, depth, archaic, um, primary natural conditions, you, on the one hand we can't avoid them, you know, it's filled with housing with a Z. Um, <laughs> you know, and periphery and all of that. Um, <clears throat> the concepts that supposedly make the city easy to manage rely on generalizations. Like, you know, so you start calling people's dwellings units or office work. You know, ever since, I don't know if you have any of you have seen the Busby Barclay films of stenographers. <laughs> You know, the, the walls are all mirrors, so you have 100 stenographers multiplied to infinity. <laughs> uh, Mussolini had stenographers, the sound of typing, in his museum of fascist culture. You know, it was part of um, modernity. Um, it's amazing how incoherent the world can be, and yet people seem to recognize what is true and what isn't. So there's definitely a resource to draw on. Whether you, you know, whether you could ever challenge that um, by a, a pointing at the model of the city. That's not a film. <laughs> you know, um, or would want to. Um, or, I mean, London is, you know, somehow absorbs that. And, you know, the people who work there don't go on holiday there. They go to places like La Torre. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's like the, what really matters, it's the double world happens on weekends and on holidays. The rest of the world is kind of lived in a sort of suspension of demands and payment. You know, you, for which you're, um, the kind of, you know, everybody would agree that, I don't know, Rome is a beautiful city. My son doesn't think so, actually. Um, so that's, that's possible. Um, <laughs> uh, but it, it, the, 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 the fact that we you know, live in this kind of world where, I mean, Latour called it hybrid in, in his book, We Are Never, we are Never Modern. He, he calls us, we are always pre-Socratic. Um, that as much as we live in this kind of world, that depends on face-to-face -face discourse. That depends on having, you know, siblings, parents, lovers, enemies, all those things that, you know, uh, fill out a world. And, and it, it, so it's not a problem to deal with this, except if you're talking to somebody. Mm -hmm. And they stop in the middle and answer their phone, you know, and you say, that's me, <clears throat> or whatever else. <laughs> can I talk? <laughs> can I use your phone? Uh -huh. um, can I? Anyway. Um, <laughs> And so when we talk about creating conditions, it's certainly not about more concepts. And it's, and it's actually, you know, when you say to, uh, you know, and you can't tell the client, to look, it's the, the thing you're talking about isn't just what you see in those photographs. You know, they come to you with a, an image from, I don't know, GQ magazine. 
And you say, look, it's, it's much deeper. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear that it's possible, that it's, you know, that you can deliver. And, you know, if you get a long conversation, then perhaps they're bored or perhaps they're prepared, but they're fairly rare. So when you're talking about creating conditions, you're creating conditions through personal relations, through, you know, your buildings, obviously. Um, it's very hard to say no when you've got kids to feed or whatever else. And you do the, the Nick Ray answer was always somebody will do it worse than me. And you say to yourself, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Um, this is being filmed, you know. <laughs> no, that kind of compromises. We'll let it, we'll let it. I mean, um, <clears throat> to be given a monastery to do, I mean, there's, the, I, I think, you know, to, if you go to um, La Tourette, there's still a nucleus of a city there, even though the Corbusier had no fucking idea what a city was. Mm -hmm. You know, he just forgot that he depended on Paris for all of his dreams, and for, or kept suppressing um, <clears throat> kept whinging about Paris. <clears throat> and yet if it weren't for Paris, he would be nowhere. Um, he'd quote Rabelais, and then it would become for... You know, on the other hand, you get into stuff the scale of a bit, and that's something that modernism has been very good at, generally middle-sized buildings. You can't do that as an architect. You can't, you know, you can't just sit down at your drawing board and do a city. It's something that has to be done politically, collaboratively. And so, there's been, one of the big enemies in architecture schools has been top-down, meaning master planning. And everybody's idea of master planning is, of course, something like Albert Speer. You know, <clears throat> I want that there. And you know, the German army says, make sure that it happens for the SS. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that is, you know, to do it bottom up, incrementally, is, is obviously nuts. I mean, you can, it's great that there are pop ups, it's great that there are you know, people making you know, neighborhoods, but it's, localism is, is obviously a kind of scam that allows the developer to do what he pleases. Um, Proper localism, a proper, you know, something like a Cartier is very, very hard to find. I think there are more people who care about such things now than when, you know, I started teaching architecture. So there's definitely hope. But I, you know, to make a city is a real, you know, it's not something that can be done as a vision. It really is a deeper culture. And of course, I, and I think a lot of that is still, you know, as I say, is, is latently there. I think. You know, an immense amount of what both, both Dalibor and David said, I obviously agree with. Um, I th um, one of the things that we do with the course at London Met is we work on a thing we call practical wisdom as a way of trying to take architecture out of theory, out of, you know, form and space, and make it part of what more people do more people think about, more people to, can take seriously. They don't just go, you know, in and sit down, as it were. And it brings in, you know, it, 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 we, we look at, you know, stuff from um, favelas and um, slums in India to, um, I mean, there's a, there's a range of, um, stuff and doing very contemporary stuff in London, blah, blah, blah. Um, and putting that together, one begins to see what depth, you know, how people do rely on it. That Dalibor used to speak all the time about smuggling the experience under the table. That comes up, you know, and that's what the two worlds was partly about. And that just comes up again and again. What people trust, you know, Hawaii, you know, you get all this management speak, and you say, okay, what's that based on? And once you get to those, then, then there's a conversation.